I hail from the big city of Luland, Texas. But if you went to Luland, Texas, and you asked the folks in Luland, do they know Frank Jackson? They say, yeah, I know Frank Jackson. That's Robbie Jackson's boy. But they say, but Robbie's not from Luland, Texas. So Robbie's from outside of Luland at a place called Iteen, Texas. And if you went out to Iteen, Texas, and you ask for Robbie Jackson's people, they would say, well, the Jacksons are not here from our team. They, they from over there by Canoe Creek. And if you went out to Canoe Creek, you would see the remnants of an old church house that sits up on some old stumps or logs, some old mesquite logs, and it's tilted on the side, and many of the windows are broken out, and you go inside, there's some a wasp's nest and dirt dogs' nest all inside, and some of those broke up Martin Luther King Jr. fans that sits on the pews in that church. But that's where we we're from. And if you went out there back when my folks lived out there, you would walk into what they call shotgun houses. That's them houses where you can stand on the front porch and see straight out the back door. And if you went inside of one of those houses, you, you may have a cause to look under the, at the floor and you can see straight up under the house. And you may see an old dog laying up under the house and chickens running in the backyard and People just walk out there and just scrape the food out the back door. I grew up in a time when African Americans, especially African American males, the only kind of jobs we could get in Luland, Texas was working in the watermelon fields or picking cotton or hauling hay. It was during the time where we had just as many beer joints as we had church houses. And many of y'all in Austin may not know nothing about beer joints. See, a beer joint is not a nightclub because Inevitably, on Saturday night, somebody's going to get in a fight. Somebody's going to get cut or somebody's going to get shot. And even in little country town, that kind of madness went on. And I used to always ask my mother, I said, Mama, why we got to live like this? Why we got to live over here on these, on these rock streets? Why we got to go through these changes when, when we're working out in those fields, we're working right alongside of folks that just got out of the penitentiary? But we learned more about prison life than we did about college life. We knew what happened to you when you checked into the pen. And we knew what you had to do when you, to survive in the pen. But those that had the opportunity to go to college, many of them only came back home when it was a, a holiday or somebody's funeral. So we didn't get a chance to really find out about it. And you see, when, when I first went to Prairie View, I was one of those kids that, that was supposed to go to technical school, DeVry Institute of Technology. But my daddy didn't have the $200 tuition that was required for me to go. So my mother called her sister that lived in Houston. And her sister said that she knew somebody that could get me in prayer. Yeah, yeah. And so two weeks before the school was to start, I went to prayer and I filled out all of the financial aid forms that, that's the first time I realized that we were poor. Mama was making less than $3,000 a year, so I qualified for everything. <laughs> but I didn't know I was poor because we, I never was going for a lack of having something good to eat. I ate a lot of oatmeal and served sandwiches, and we, we lived, but, but we just didn't know we was poor because I always had a decent suit to wear to church and some clean shoes to wear to church, and when they got old, they became a school shoe. So mama was able to juggle and make ends meet, and we didn't even know how she was doing it sometimes. But when I got to college, I, I was so far behind that veil of ignorance that I didn't even know I was ignorant. When I got to Prairie View, they lined us up in the gym, and they said, all those that want to be engineers, come over here. And one of the professors asked me, say, Jackson, don't you want to be an engineer? Well, I was so ignorant, I said, I want to be an engineer. I don't want to drive a train because I didn't know what an engineer was. The only engineer I ever saw was the engineer that came by on that train coming through Luton. So I was behind that veil and, and Prairie View didn't laugh at me. They said, come here, just bring your little behind right on here. And they start lifting that veil. You see that veil that I want to talk to you about just a little bit this evening. It's the same veil Dr. W.E.B. DeBose talked about in his book, Souls of Black Folk. In that chapter on the training of black men, Dr. DeBose said these things, and he, he said there were three streams of thinking 
that came down to us from the death ship. He said the first thought was the thought of the, of the old world. He said that Europeans had come to believe that God had so blessed their enterprise that it was their duty to subdue the ends of the earth and all men and draw them nearer, thus forming a new humanity. He said, but behind that thought was a dark and sinister afterthought of force and dominion. The making of black and brown and yellow men to dare when the temptation of beads and red calico cloth. He said a second thought that streamed down to us from the death ship was the thought of the older South. You see, sometimes here in Texas, we forget that we are in the older South. We think the older South was Mississippi, Louisiana, Al Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. But see, Texas was part of the Confederacy also. Texas was the last one to really surrender. But the both said that the older South fervently and passionately believed that somewhere between man and cattle, God created this tertium quid, this intermediate thing, and called it a Negro a simple clownish creature, yet lovable within its limitations. But he said behind that thought was an even darker and sinister afterthought that the older South also knew that perhaps by chance some of them may become men. Some of them may get somebody to get in their heads and lift that veil of ignorance. Some of them may learn to use their intellect. So out of pure self-defense, the plantation owners and the aristocracy of the old South decided that we dare not let them. So we, we, they decided to build around us a wall so wide and place between us and any knowledge of veil so thick that we would not even think of breaking through. And the third and the darkest thought that streamed down to us from the death ship was the thoughts of the things themselves. Dr. DeBose said that you would ask the average Negro at the turn of the last century, around 1901, he'd say, what do you want? They would say, vouchsafe for us, so boastful world, the chances of living men. Freedom, opportunity, equality. He said, but out of all those hundreds of years of bondage, out of all those hundreds of years of living behind that veil that even the Negro had come to believe, that perhaps the world is right. Perhaps we are not like other men. Perhaps all these things are some mad impulse, some mock mirage from the untrue. This is the tangle of thought and afterthought that Dr. DeBose shaped our very thinking and made him come to the conclusion that the problem of the 20th century was a problem of the color line. You see, we have an obligation to these young children to lift that veil. We have an obligation to tell them the truth, and sometimes the truth makes you cry. Sometimes we're so far behind that veil that we don't even want to recognize it. I remember when, when growing up in Lula, they say, well, what about Africa? It's only here about them old Africa. Oh, I don't know, ain't, ain't no African here. I don't know, black Africa. We were so far behind that veil, even when Dr. King was marching, I heard black men say, oh, Martin Luther King ought to set his old butt down. Just making trouble for colored folks. He just leave things alone. It's going to be all right. We were so far behind that veil that we didn't even like ourselves. You see, when we, when we come from behind that veil, when we teach our children the truth, we got to tell them our whole story. We got we to gotta take them back to ancient Africa. We got to do just like they did when they used to ask the ancient Africans that stood on the shores of the Mediterranean, they say, where did you come from, black man? We tell them we came from a place where the mountains of the moon meet the headwaters of the Nile River and the great god Hopi lives. We came out of those high mountains of Ethiopia and they got the bones of Lucy right now running through Texas so you can go down there and see this ancient woman. You can also look on the internet and come up with DNA and they found that every human being on this planet, they can trace their ancestry back to this one woman in East Africa, and they symbolically call her Eve. So that means that all human beings have the same mother. That means that this idea of race is more political than it is biological. 